over the last 20 years or more, the actual growth in technology and science-linked jobs has been about 4.2 percent per year. The actual availability of U.S.-born uh, workers in those fields has been has grown at about 1.5 percent per year. And then when you look at uh, jobs in new areas, in the nanotechnology arena, for instance, uh, people say one of the greatest challenges they have is finding a well-qualified workforce. And, and that's at a baseline level, that we're not talking necessarily people with masters and PhDs. At the higher educational levels, we really are not attracting uh, many uh, or as many young people as we should, particularly to not only get first degrees in these fields, but to move on and get graduate degrees. Now, fortunately for us, we've been able to attract really exquisite talent from abroad. And so that's been kind of the secret sauce that we've always been able to attract talent from abroad. But you know what? Other countries now, they're emulating our model. They're creating massive research infrastructure, building up their universities, uh, creating new enterprises with a lot of government support. And they are beginning to attract uh, many of these uh, educated people in the sciences and engineering back home. But there's a global race for talent. So they're also being attracted to places that may not be back home, but they're not necessarily uh, countries that uh, are where we would think. And so that means they aren't necessarily staying here. So yes, I think there is still a quiet crisis because it's a subtle point. It's quiet because we sort of don't know what the situation is until it's upon us, partly because people quietly retire. There are trends that, that occur, but we don't see the real underlying trend for years. But also, it takes a long time to create a high-functioning theoretical physicist or a nuclear engineer. And so it's a time factor that, that makes us you know, not see it. In addition, a lot of the technologies that we take for granted and where a lot of the cool things come from, whether we're talking iPods or iPads or, or Kindles or Xboxes, really are built on technologies that were developed 20 and 30 and 40 years ago and discoveries that were made that long ago. So it's quiet becomes it, it kind of creeps in on us. But it's a crisis because it turns out that scientists and engineers only comprise about 5% of the workforce. And so by the time we come to grips with the situation, the fact that it takes so long to really educate a person, to really be well grounded in these arenas, it's a crisis, it's a crisis because we can't fix it fast at that point. The Obama administration has a very strong commitment to uh, science and engineering, to supporting basic research, to appreciating the role of science and technology in helping to solve some of our greatest challenges, whether we're talking energy security or climate change. If you witness what the, who the Secretary of Energy is and, and the kinds of things he's been trying to propagate, if you look at who the next direct, the, the new director of the uh, NIH is, uh, the National Institutes of Health, and, and you look at the kinds of things that he has done in his career and what he's trying to do uh, at NIH, there's a recentering on the fundamental role of science and engineering. But there's also a lot more support uh, for basic research, but more importantly, there's the leadership from the top, because the president himself speaks about the importance of this, and in fact challenges scientists and engineers as well to take more of an active role in reaching out and, and educating and exciting young people and helping people to understand it. And, and he's doing this against a backdrop, as you know, of a very difficult uh, economic and budgetary situation. But the scientific community is very much more hopeful, I would say. Well, there's a level at which one could argue that all industries to be at the leading edge and, and for us to be globally competitive uh, and rebuild our manufacturing and our export base uh, have and need a route 
in the latest breakthroughs in science and engineering. And having said that, let me go back to, your, to the commentary about the, the U.S. auto industry and whether we should write it off. You know, there's, there's kind of a, a, a story that people uh, probably don't think about so much, and that is uh, 20 or more years ago, the U.S. was very worried about uh, losing its lead and edge in advanced uh, chip, you know, microprocessor design and manufacturing, at that point to Japan. And so uh, with government support, a consortium of what are really some fairly large companies came together to lay out a technology roadmap as to what uh, the industry needed to do and, and where the government could support what the industry needed to do to, to stay ahead of the curve, to, to sort of catch up, as it were, and then stay ahead of the curve. And that roadmap essentially has been followed, and that's why we have the great Intels and, and, and the uh, other uh, major uh, chip design and manufacturing enterprises uh, still in this country, and where a lot of the manufacturing, not all of it, but a lot of it still goes on here. So I wouldn't quite write the, the auto industry off, although there are a lot of structural uh, issues and changes that need to occur. But having said that, if one wants to think about the workforce of the future and what kinds of characteristics uh, people need to have, people have to be a lot more intellectually agile than they are because things change so fast. And, and markets really are global. And, and innovation is everywhere. And people, even if they work for one company, are going to find that they're going to be working with counterparts around the globe. And, and that they're going to need to at least understand and appreciate how to at least ride the wave of new and evolving technologies to optimize what they do in their own business processes and their own enterprises even if those enterprises are not high-tech, so to speak. But at the same time, as I always argue, we need more scientists than engineers because to, the way to really be globally preeminent is to be innovative and stay ahead of the innovation curve. We still are the most innovative country in the world, but where we've been lagging is continuing to invest and move ahead on those, uh, in those areas that have kept us ahead, focus on fundamental research, having the kind of infrastructure one needs to help uh, new entrepreneurial startup companies cross the various valleys of death, create uh, the kind of uh, workforce that is minimally scientifically literate and out of which we hope will come more scientists and engineers. Mm -hmm.